Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Kaz Salim and you're tuning into Radio Alarms. Today I have one of my friends from the good old days of school, Abdul Sami in the studio. Abdul Sami is an accounting and finance major at Lums who is one of the most talented individuals who have had the opportunity to work with. Sami is the founder of Fincro Insights, a finance and cryptocurrency blog site. He is also the founder of Meleora, a personalized vitamin and supplement startup. Last year he interned at PwC as an audit intern. More recently, Sami came back from the Dubai office of Bain and Company as part of their associate consultant internship program. We'll try to dive deep into his journey over the past few months working in one of the most prestigious firms from across the globe. But first, how are you doing Sami? How's the semester treating you? I am good, Kas. How are you? I'm doing um, great. So, I think summers ke baad it generally takes some time to you know get used to the university life. But it's going well so far. The semester is picking up pace gradually. So, it's okay. all good. Okay, cool. How many credit hours do you have? I have 16 right now. So, it's relatively oh, yeah. less compared to the previous years where I had about 19, 20 each semester. Okay. Um how many in the last semester though? I had 19. Oh, so the last semester for before you graduate. Oh, so I I have 12. So, before we dive deep into your journey at Bain, Um could you provide all those people watching who might not be aware of the consulting atmosphere within Pakistan uh, a brief overview of the consulting industry and its presence within Pakistan that sounds great um to be very honest when when i first joined lums i had no clue what consulting was i had no clue what bain mckinsey um bcg were i didn't even know that this was a field because i used to think um, early in the early days why would a company hire someone else to solve their problems when they have employees working for them full time but it's actually a very big and it's a very it's a growing um field but in simple terms what consulting is it's consultants basically help companies solve problems and i think the best way to understand the consulting realm is through the analogy of a doctor and i think we can break that down into different components to jis tarah ek patient ek doctor ke paas aata hai and they tell them unko kya disease hai ya how are they feeling similarly a client comes to the company and they tell them that this is the issue that they are facing but it's possible ke wo jo issue hai that might not be the actual issue right to agar ek patient keh raha hai ke i have flu or i have fever maybe it might be something different right so what does the doctor do then they, they conduct tests maybe it could be x rays it could be um, blood samples just to determine exactly what the problem is similarly what a consultant does is they use data they they interact with the employees of the company just to drill down into exactly what the problem is um step number 3 over here for a doctor is ek bar jab doctor ko pata chal jata hai ke this is the problem what's the next step a doctor gives medicine so that the patient ultimately gets cured right um similarly what a consultant does is ek bar jab consultant ko pata chal gaya ki this is the exact problem they develop a strategy uh, which involves brainstorming it involves research and what it does is it ultimately helps that client or company solve that particular problem so i think the analogy of a doctor is the best way to understand um what consultants do and what consulting is yeah i think that's a pretty catchy analogy that um uh, all of us who've been wanting to get into consulting have been brought up on over the past few years all right let's get a little more specific about bain and company um and their presence in the mina region more specifically within pakistan um as well as the aci program that you were a part of sure um but like before i dive deep into bain uh, i think we need to understand that there are different types of consulting firms you've got strategy consulting firms that mainly deal with high level problems and they work directly with the c suite you've got consulting firms that work in the development sector mainly with the governments different different governments then you've got um, c- consulting firms that work mainly in the tech t- tech tech aspect so bain's role in all of this bain is basically a strategy consulting firm they help provide advisory to c suite and the problems they deal with the deal with they're actually very high level and they're actually pretty broad too so you you can see them working in the public sector you you see them working um in advanced manufacturing you you see them working in private equity too so you see them working in different aspects um bain standing within strategy consulting it's 
it's actually a very prestigious organization. It's ranked amongst the top three strategy consulting firms worldwide, alongside McKinsey and BCG. Um, and recently, they just turned 50 years. Um, wh what is Bain's involvement in LUMS, I would say? I would I, say happy half century to Bain. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so I think in, in LUMS, so they, they've been coming to LUMS for quite a couple quite a few years yeah, yeah. but they've mainly been coming for their full-time offers yeah. as associate consultant but recently they they launched their internship program for lums too okay. right uh, it's it's been two years so i think it's it's been it's, it's been getting a lot of traction especially yeah. from the students because you get international exposure you mm. get to work with different companies you get to develop hard skills soft skills and yeah. then the networking opportunity it's immense so yeah. It's Bain generally is the popularity is rising. Yeah, that's great. So I think at this point, it would be great if you could provide some clarification to everyone watching about the difference in between uh, the associate consultant role versus the associate consultant internship role, which people typically apply for in their third year. All right. Um, so I think ultimately, um, the recruitment for ACIs and ACs. So ACI is basically associate consultant yeah. intern and an AC is an associate consultant. The recruitment is pretty similar. The skill sets that are expected from both of them, they're also pretty similar because ultimately the task that an ACI will be doing once they're in Dubai, it's it's going to be exactly similar to that of an AC. Um, so the recruitment for process for both um, are pretty similar. Yeah. But then again, um, an AC is a fourth year student, right? Whereas yeah, yeah, an no. ACI, the person prepping for it is a junior. So they don't grill ACIs as much as they grill um, ACs, especially in the recruitment process. Okay, makes sense. I think we can sort of segue into the different steps that are that someone needs to go through or the different funnels, uh, different parts of the funnel that one needs to get through to get shortlisted and selected for the ACI program. So could you um, talk about all the quote-unquote buckets or the step-by-step -step process that's required to make it through to the ACI program? All right. So um, ultimately, there are four phases or four yeah. stages in the main ACI recruitment process that I had to go through. Um, so firstly, it starts off with case prep. You understand what skill sets you need to develop. You do you do casing with different people. Uh, could you maybe dive into what casing in itself is? Um, it seems like a word that's been used quite a lot. It's thrown quite a lot doing case prep. I'm doing case interviews. So maybe could you just uh, off a small tangent explain that as well while you're explaining these phases? Uh, casing is basically, it's it's a fancy way of saying yeah. that um, you're presented with a problem for a client that's maybe in any industry. And you, you need to solve that problem in a very structured manner. Um, and how you get to that problem, it's ultimately broken down into, into the four steps that we just went through when we explained the doctor analogy. Yeah. But it's just that you're going, you're going to be sol solving it with another person, maybe your peer, maybe a senior, just so that you can prepare for the actual interview itself. Yeah, cool. So the first step was case prep. Yep. Step two. So um, you'll be doing case prep. And after case prep, the second, which is like one of the most important steps, is um, passing the CV or cover letter round. Yeah. Once you get past that, the third round is you, you, get, you, you get into the round one interviews and you have yeah. three interviews. You've got an interview on, you have a behavioral interview. You've got an interview, which is a business case. And then you've got, the third interview is basically on market sizing. Yeah. If you pass all of these three interviews, then you then you're you, you go to round two, where you mainly have two interviews, and they're interviews with very high level employees at Bain. So they're mainly senior managers, associate partners, or partners. And it's it's not a proper case. It's more like a conversation you're having, and through that conversation, they're trying to gauge whether you're someone they would want to work with. So um, I think I can share my experience um, yeah. in each of these four stages. So starting off with case prep, um, I started, so Bain usually comes around mid-March, I would say. I started um, case prep um, around November, December. 
So there's this online co- course called Crafting Cases, and they teach you the different skill sets that are necessary to do casing. Now, what are those skill sets? So some of those skill sets would be could be numerical analysis. It, it could be chart interpretation, understanding different graphs. It it could even be brainstorming, um, brainstorming ideas. Um, so I did that course first, and once I completed that course, I found myself a casing partner, and then we do cases quite frequently. We we try to see which skill sets we can improve on, um, and mainly how, even if we're doing well in those skill sets, how can we communicate in a very structured or in a very structured manner? Because structure is something which is very important. Whether it's um a pers- whether it's a behavioral interview, whether it's a casing interview. Structure is something that will differentiate you from the other candidates. So that's how I went about case prep. I did 30 cases in total. And they were cases that revolve around different industries, public mm-hmm. sector, private equity, um, even FMCG, FMCGs. Um, and they were on different problems too. So maybe I did a few cases on profitability. I did a few cases on market expansion. And so you need to make sure that the casing you're doing, it's you're getting different, you're getting a different experience through every case that you do, because that will ultimately help you grow. So I think that's that's all regarding you know case prep. Um, I had a question over here. You mentioned you did. Um, it's quite popular for those of you who might be in your third or fourth years here at university, maybe some second years as well. Um, but how long did it take you to finish the whole crafting cases content? All right. So to be honest, the, the content isn't very long. It's, yeah. I mean, if, if you dedicate enough time to it, you can wrap it up in a week. Okay. Um, I finished it in like two, three weeks. Okay. So it ultimately depends on how you balance it with, you know, your, extra quick learns and then mm. obviously the university workload itself too but it's it's doable within two to three weeks so and it's it's structured yeah. in a way where the videos they aren't very lengthy and it's easy for you to you know pay attention to those videos yeah. um so i don't think it, it takes you a lot of time to you know all right so you mentioned you started your preparation around november or december correct so how much time do you think you were giving um in hours per week to case prep, crafting cases, and any other resources that you were using back then? So uh, so I did crafting cases first, and then yeah. I moved on to cases once I finished okay. crafting cases. And um, for crafting cases, I think I was spending five to 10 hours every week. Okay. Um, and I did this for like one, one and a half month. Okay. Um, when it came to casing, I was... So how casing works is you yeah. generally have a casing partner yeah and it's actually two-sided so so in one setting you're doing your case with another casing partner but then you also help them do their case so that one sitting it's generally like three four hours because after every case you also need to give them feedback on how they can improve and you're also making notes on the side so i would say i i used to have like two to three sessions two to three um, casing sessions every week which was about like 10 to 12 hours and so for these casing sessions, did you do these cases with just one particular case partner or did you do this with, you know, a wide number of different people? So um, initially I did it with the same person. Yeah. Um, but over time, you need to realize that the feedback that you're going to get from that person, it's going to be pretty similar. And at that point in time, you need to realize that you need to find mm. more experienced people. So what I did was I used to reach out to seniors. I used to reach out to um, consultants who are working in Bain, McKinsey, and I do casing with them. And And the feedback that I used to get from there, it used to be very enriching. So the best way to go about this is to have one casing partner that's permanent because they, they know they're doing casing with you very frequently. So they know what your weaknesses and strengths are. But then at the same time, you're also doing occasional casing with very experienced people who can give you something that's completely different, right? Something that you never thought of. All right. Uh, I want to dive into some specifics right now because I've had a little bit of experience with case prep as well. And, you know, sometimes you run into the issue of this information overload. You're doing this 40-minute case. 
you run into all of these roadblocks. Sometimes those are related to the case in itself. Sometimes those are repetitive mistakes that you're making. Um, and the feedback can be immense at time. And so it's almost like you're trying to deal with a fire hydrant of information. So how are you keeping track of everything? Were you just noting it down in a Google Doc? Were you maintaining a journal? So what was your process like? Yeah, sure. So um, I used to maintain a case log yeah. where I used to write down like, so I used to share it with the people I was doing casing with. So, they, so they'd so mention the case that we were working on and then they'd write down all the feedback yeah. pertaining to that particular case in that Google Doc. And before I did every new case, I used to go through all of the feedback that I had received in the past one to two weeks, like the most recent feedback. Um, and I'd be conscious of those areas while doing casing. Hmm. Um, I think so. I think one point you mentioned was regarding some of the errors. Yeah being very gen generic and then some errors pertaining to particular um, cases. Yeah. Um, I think so. I was I was having a conversation with um, a consultant at Bain. Yeah. And he, what I thought was case-specific issues weren't really case-specific issues because you oh, can yeah. generalize them. So um, one of the issues is mainly regarding, so when you start the case, you need to introduce that particular industry, give some insights, right? But it could be tricky at times. So, for example, if I'm given um, a case on e-commerce, let's suppose, maybe I, I might have no clue. Yeah. Or if I'm given a case on um, old homes, old age homes, I, I might have no clue because that's not mm. popular in Pakistan, right? You don't you yeah, don't yeah. see old age homes. But I think the advice that he gave me is to compa compare it with something that's very similar. Mm. So, um, the best alternative for old age homes is the hotel industry, right? Okay. So, I so I think that that just made me realize yeah. um, problems that you think that are very specific to particular cases aren't. Yeah. You can you can generalize them and you can you can even overcome those issues and make sure that you're not making the same mistakes all over again. Makes sense. So you're trying to draw parallels alongside each different yeah uh, case. Makes sense. Makes sense. So let's move on to the next phase of the recruitment cycle, which is the CV round. So how did you tackle this part of the? Uh, internship program so i think something that's very important for consulting or that consultants or generally what's important in the consulting industry it's impact whether you're working with a client wh whatever work you're doing you want to see the impact that you're creating for whoever you work with right so it's the similar type of impact that people who are re reviewing your cv want to see present in the cv right so whatever activity you did whatever internship you did Ultimately, you need to start off by mentioning the impact that your work created. And second to that is how did you create that impact? So that's that that's the format that's that helps you create a very good CV. Um, when I was creating my CV, so I did two things. So there's this guide that's created by Hasham Javed. He was an ex-president of LCG. And he's currently a senior associate consultant at Bain. Shout out to LCG. <laughs> um, and th that guy that he's developed, it's it's amazing. It tells you exactly how you want your CV to look like. And it also has feedback on the cover letter. Yeah. And the cover letter for um, Bain is the make or break. Because if they're short, if they're shortlisting CVs and they've, and they've shortlisted a lot of CVs, Let's, let's suppose they have like 20, 30 CVs, right? They're not going to give all of them interviews. That's when they're going to look at the cover letters and figure out how how can how can they further shortlist from those 20, 30 CVs. Um, the format for cover letter ultimately, I mean, it's supposed to be it's, it's supposed to be very personalized um, because only then will you be able to differentiate yourself from the entire applicant pool. But a good format would be where you start off top down, where you're starting off with why you're passionate about consulting and you need to be truly honest why you're passionate because they, they can see if you're lying or not um so you start off with why why you're passionate about consulting and then you grill down into why bain in particular there's so many consulting firms why does bain attract you um and for that second question what helps a lot is if you network with bain consultants if you attend um their recruitment sessions in lums because it provides you with a lot of insights and then the third question which is also like it is a differentiating factor because it differentiates you from the other people. It's why you, why you in particular from all of all of the applicant pool. Why do you 
deserve a shot at this internship. So that's that's it regarding the CV and cover letter fees. Um, if if you make it past this, then then comes the round one interviews. You yeah. have three interviews, and I think ultimately what they're trying to gauge is um, your business acumen, how structured your thought process is. But the ultimate litmus test is: Would they want to have you on their team? Would Would they enjoy working with you? If that's a yes, that means you're easily going to make it to the next round. And if, if even if you if you pass the same litmus test in the in round two, then you're going to get a return offer. It's simple as that. All right. So I want to go off on a little bit of a tangent about an issue that I personally struggle with quite a lot, and I assume that quite a lot of people who are doing case prep might be struggling right now, and that is case prep mathematics. And it's one of those things where you're trying to do stuff like taking 2% of 5 billion. And you typically aren't used to dealing with, you know, millions and billions. Um, the last time you probably might have done that would have been the fifth grade. And in university, that's not the kind of mathematics that you do. And you don't really have a calculator to do that kind of math either. And if you mess up just one or two of the zeros, that can be a pretty big uh, mistake. And so how did you tackle the case interview math? And could you maybe share some examples of the math that you faced? If you remember any of those from your interview? So I think how you can prep for math is mainly through crafting cases. So it, it has an entire module on math. And when you're doing that module, you do realize, so when you talk about structure, I mean, you can see structure in frameworks when you're breaking a problem down, but you can also see structure within math too. So um, if we take the example of maybe if we're trying to see how a company can increase market share, let's say. So what's the form? So ultimately, how, how do you break the formula of a mar of market share, right? It's, it's the sales of a company over total sales, right? Yeah. Now, how could you increase a market share? You can either increase a market share by increasing the sales of the company exactly. or you can see the total market share declining, declining. how do you see that how, how do you see the market total market share declining maybe it's by some firms exiting the market right so you can break that market share component down into different components so similarly yeah. like if you if you get um, a question on profitability let's say how, how can you break profitability down you can break it down into revenue and cost right how can you break revenue down? You can break revenue down into price and quantity. If you can break that ultimate question down into different components, that just makes math easier. Um, regarding calculations, because there's a huge chunk that you can make an error, interviewers are aware that you're there's there's a high chance that you can make an error over there. But that's where you can round off figures. So and just to clarify, there are no calculators allowed, right? Yeah, there are no calculators allowed. It's all mental math. Um, and it's and it's at that point in time where you can round up numbers, you can round down numbers. But then when you're rounding up and down, you need to make sure that you're rounding it in a way where it makes calculation calculating the numbers easier for you. All right. So as of right now, we're done with the case prep. We're done with building our resumes and writing our cover letters. And now it's on to round one and round two interviews. Is there anything else that we might be missing off right now? Um, so I think one thing that you should be aware of is, so round one interviews, they're very different from round two interviews. Round one interviews are very structured. So you know how the case is going to start. You're going to get a case prompt, which is basically telling you what the problem of the client is. Once you get the prompt, um, you're, you're basically going to be solving it, right? You're going to develop a framework. Then you're going to tell them next steps and, and the conversation is going to continue and you'll know how to move forward. But in round two interviews, it's completely unstructured. It, okay. it could literally go anywhere. So I, I'll give you an example, uh, my round two interview as an example. So it started off with, um, it was basically a case prompt that was given to me. And it was basically on profitability. It was, um, I think it was an e-commerce platform. It was a FinTech company. They were suffering from it was an e-commerce platform. So they were suffering from, they weren't, they weren't generating a lot of revenue. Um, 
So I asked a clarifying question over here, and that was basically around what the consumer segments are. So, what customers is that particular e-commerce targeting? Um, it was supposed to be like a framework question. Okay. But I never made the framework in the entire case. So, when I asked this question, the interviewer told me, "Why don't you tell me what the um, what the different c- customer segments could be?" So I had to think about it in a very structured manner. And then from that point on, we moved on to casing math, okay. figuring out what percentage of revenue would be derived from each of those customer segments. Hmm. So the the entire purpose of telling this is uh, round two interviews could go anywhere. So maybe the first question might be on framework, but you might never create a framework. No. So th- that's something that differentiates round one from round two. Um, but I think one thing that really helped me out is whether it whether it's round one interview whether it's round two interview just remember one thing and it's you're you're trying to be a consultant right so no matter what they throw at you you just need to solve that problem in a very structured manner if you can do that no matter what they throw at you you're doing a good job so that's the whole aci process but you made it to dubai right so how was the experience living in dubai all the way from pakistan and How long was the whole internship program? The internship was about nine weeks long. Um, nine weeks long. I moved a couple of days back. Okay. Um, and then I also left like a few days after my internship. So let's just say I, I think ten, eleven weeks. I I, I spent ten, eleven weeks in Dubai. And would you be willing to share why <laughs> why why that delay occurred? Um, sure. I think you. I think you're aware of that story. Could the say. people know about that story as well? Sure. So, um. So I think so this started off with the day I had my flight to Dubai. I was super excited. It was a Thursday. I was the internship was supposed to start on Monday. So I was hoping to go a few days back, you know, settle in, prepare myself before the internship starts. Um I I had my flight Thursday early morning. And I arrived at the airport. I had my visa, I had everything. I thought I had everything. Um and when i go to the check in counter they're like you can't you can't onboard the flight and this is my first time traveling alone so i was like kind of shocked why can't i travel because i i thought i had all the documents um and apparently if you're going on a work visa abroad you need this particular stamp and i was unaware about it i i had no clue we were supposed to get it so um i was kind of shocked because i had my flight booked i had everything um but the good thing was it was a thursday and we were supposed to get that stamp from the government office so if i had my flight on friday that would have meant that um the office would have closed and i would have traveled to dubai like once the internship had started so i would have been late yeah so right after um that incident i i ran to the government office got my stamp and then booked a flight on the same day So I think it was it was a hassle but I think it was an interesting start. To- that that's a pretty unusual start for sure. Um but you made it though. You made it to Dubai. What was the work like over there? Uh so, nine weeks. Uh but you working on a single project? Um yep. So we had one week of training at the start. Okay. And then we were ultimately assigned to a case. So a case is pretty similar to an engagement where you're working with a client with a case team. Um so I worked with the casting for 8 weeks and then i had one week of training at the start okay. um so the type of work that i did uh it mainly revolved around three things so i was i was involved a lot with excel modeling so the case that i was working on it was basically a digital transformation case it was a strategy implementation case we can say digital transformation was a part of it um and the excel modeling that i did it was ultimately to figure out what type of digital transformation initiatives we had how can we prioritize them over um a a road map in a quantitative manner um so like we i developed an entire excel model around that then i think th- this internship actually made me realize that you do a huge chunk of research no matter what conclusion you arrive at no matter what analysis you're doing ultimately you need to back it with benchmarks whether it's benchmarks of local entities international entities 
but you need to showcase that it's being implemented somewhere else in the world and that it's successful. Um, the third aspect, and it it's something that almost everyone who knows something about consulting is aware of, it's slide making. It's a part of the job. Um, and you'll see a huge chunk of slide making within um, the consulting world. So I think I, I work around these three aspects mainly. But for me, I think the work was very empowering because the work that I did, it was presented to CEO, CEOs, it was presented to um, government ministers too. Um, but I think with great power, you know, comes great responsibility. There's this very important concept at Bain. It's called zero defect. Okay. You need to make sure that whatever work you're producing, it's error free. Because I think, I mean, Bain has a good repute, right? And you No pressure, make, right? Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> Um, but I think so the good thing about this is you've got layers of sanity checking so the work that I do it would ultimately get checked by an associate consultant and then that work would then get checked by a consultant and it would ultimately climb up to the partner before being presented to the client so I mean even though we were being empowered but there were still you know checks and ba checks and balances in place just to make sure we weren't you know messing up pretty badly um, so, but I think it was like the experience overall was very enriching in, in that sense. And could you share the quote unquote consultant lifestyle you were living? Yeah. You did mention that you were somewhat of a nomad while you were traveling around so much. So could you talk a little more about that aspect? So I think the lifestyle was interesting. Um, I mean, the, the life of a consult consultant, it's, it's, it's very happening. It's very fast paced. Um, I'd be working 60 to 65 hours every week. I mean, you'd, you'd have the weekend to recover, but then like the week, it would be, it would be a mess. Um, and an, an average work week would look, so how an average work week would, would look like, it was basically where we'd push a lot in the early half of the week. So Monday to Wednesday, we'd be working 14 hours, 15 hours. And then after these three days of grind, um, Thursday go it would be relatively light and by relatively light I mean 8 9 p.m so that's starting from 9 a.m so, so from 9 to 9 yeah that's, that, a, light that's a relatively light that's day a relatively us. light day when you're working 14 15 <laughs> hours every day I and mean, what's a Monday like from 9 to 9 a.m to I mean 11 12 yeah I okay. think so the worst I worked so the latest I worked till is 2 a.m and so what happens is you know you need to be in the office, whether it's the client site or at the Bain office. You need to, you need to be there at 9 a.m. But you don't know when you're going to end the day. Um, but the, the good thing is, Fridays are relatively chill. Because you end at 6 p.m. So 6 p.m. is like a very bad day for maybe like an average corporate company. Yeah. But over here, it's the it's, earliest that you can get. the earliest you can get. <laughs> yes. So everyone's looking forward to Friday in the office. Yes, everyone's looking forward to Friday. Yeah. Um, but that was regarding work. Um, there's a lot of traveling too. Um, in my case, I was basically working with a Saudi Saudi client. So I'd be traveling to Saudi on the weekends. And then I'd be at the client side in Saudi uh, during the weekdays. And then I'd be traveling back to Dubai for the weekend. So there'd be... so. I think your weekends would also be busy because you're just, you, traveling. You're just traveling. Yeah, So you're <laughs> okay. working on the weekdays and then you're traveling on the weekends. How long were the flights from Dubai to Saudi? Um, so it was, it was two hours long. Okay. So not, th not, not that, that, long, not not that, that long, long, but, but still, but I mean, you need to be at the airport, but you need to hours, airport two, hours, check in airport. baggage. And then, on. I mean, even on, even if you have a flight on Sunday, like the entire Saturday is going to be spent thinking about the next day you have a flight, okay. you need to pack. You need to make sure you're not missing something out, especially your laptop, because if you don't have your laptop, you can't work. But you're going to Saudi though. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're coming back. And so how were these meetings like? What kind of executives were you interacting with? And um, how were these meetings like? You know, what sort of people were you meeting? Um, what level of people and organizations were you meeting? So um, as an intern, you don't get a lot of client exposure. Um, I never interacted with the client. I might have seen them maybe with a consultant or maybe with a manager, but I never interacted with them directly. Um, 
but the entire team we used to sit at the client side so it used to be a round table where mm-hmm. the entire team sitting together working collectively it used to be a very nice environment but i didn't get a lot of client exposure okay. but it was mainly around you know work and team i was mainly in the team setting so okay so in a typical day what does most of your work look like are you typically in meetings or are you working on some of your own personal work such as working on slides or running excel models um so i think ultimately it depends on the position right okay so i think so as an aci i did, i did not attend any client meetings okay all the meetings i did attend meetings but they were mainly with partners they were internal bain meetings um so i would say in a day you 20% of your day as an aci or maybe an ac would be spent in meetings 20 30% and then the rest would be spent um doing an analysis work hmm. but as you climb up the ra- ladder the the percentage um devoted towards meetings it increases hmm. so um the associate partner we had on our case um he'd a huge chunk of his time would be spent in meetings so from 9 to 5 9 to 6 you'd see him going in and out meeting different Hmm. um clients and then post six you will start incorporating the feedback that you're getting from those meetings okay makes sense all right so coming towards the end of this interview uh let's try to conclude your whole aci experience into some core lessons learned or the core values that you derived from the whole experience what were some of your most major learnings from this whole experience could you could you just wrap up your whole experience in a few lessons learned as we reflect back on that experience sure what um, are the few things that you'd say okay these are the main highlights or these are the main lessons so i think i mean there were a lot of lessons a few of the lessons which i felt were like very crucial to my growth on me se ek to ye tha how to be 80 20 and what do we mean when we say how to be 80 20 it's basically how can you be more efficient how can you be more productive with your time and isme what i realized was whenever you're given a task think about the output think about what you want it to look like and then think about how you're going to get there uh this helped a lot in research so for example if i'm trying to understand maybe a particular entity that say um if i figure out what's the ultimate goal maybe my ultimate goal is to figure out um whether i should invest in that entity right that's my ultimate goal if i know that's my end goal in mind ab maine kis cheez pe focus karna hai i want to focus on indicators that will help me figure out whether it's a good investment right i might focus on profitability i might focus on industry growth rate maybe um maybe growth growth factors so once i've identified kaun se factors are relevant to my ultimate goal my focus is going to be very narrow right so i won't be focusing on information jo ke irrelevant hai um and and instead of spending 20 30 hours on a task i i'll probably spend 5 6 hours and the, initially i was struggling a lot with being 80 20 but over time i realized with practice you can you can, you can become more efficient wait task jo mai university mein i i'd spend 20 30 hours doing research maybe one two week the exact same amount of research or the exact relevant amount of research i was able to do within a couple of days um the second main lesson that i learned is to be creative wo ye ke sometimes when you're doing research you won't find all the information in the same area ya agar aap search kar bhi rahe ho google pe आपको लगेगा कि यार मुझे ये मिल नहीं रहा बट यू नीट दैट्स वन यू नीड टू बी क्रिएटिव दैट्स वट दैट्स वन यू नीड टू रियलाइज दैट दैट इन्फॉर्मेशन इट डज एग्जिस्ट ऑन द इंटरनेट यू आर नॉट जस्ट सर्चिंग इट इन द राइट वे इसका सबसे अच्छा एग्जाम्पल ये था कि बेसिकली आई वॉज डूइंग अ बेंच मार्किंग ड्रिल एंड मैं जिन एंटीज पर रिसर्च कर रहा था देर वेबसाइट्स वर देर देर मेन लैंग्वेज ऑन द वेबसाइट वॉज इंग्लिश ठीक है तो मैं वहाँ पे ढूंढ रहा था मुझे कुछ नहीं मिल रहा था मैन आई वॉज स्ट्रगलिंग विद दिस असाइनमेंट आई आई स्पेंड फाइव सिक्स आवर्स कुछ भी नहीं मिला सो द कंसल्टेंट हुज वर्किंग विद मी ऑन दिस पर्टिकुलर टास्क 
told me why I was restricting myself to entities that were that had websites only in English. Why wasn't I doing research on and on entities that had their website written in another language, maybe Dutch or German? Um, I, I told him I couldn't understand the language, so he told me to um think of creative ways of doing it. Basically, Jugar. Um, so I came across this um Dutch app, and I didn't understand what was being written. But then I used Google Translator, Google Lens to basically translate that website, and I was able to come across insights that were relevant, exactly relevant to what I was trying to find. So it just made me realize that you need to be creative at times to find exactly what you're looking for. But I think the biggest key takeaway for me was that I was able to live the life of a consultant, right? Um, and I think this internship it's 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 made me realize that I enjoy doing work that's strategy oriented that. that forces me to think a lot that forces me to explore different industries um and it's made me realize that i want to do consulting in the future so i think these were like my three main key takeaways or lessons that i've learned um through this internship um so as we just conclude this episode uh for everyone that's watching would you have some final recommendations for people who are going to be applying for the aci program from lums this year what would be some of your key or core recommendations for those people um before we move on to recommendations um i think i i just realized that we missed one thing which was kind of important and it's important at the start of the filtering process for being aci it's it's a recruitment game oh, yeah. um and it's actually important because they're ultimately testing your business acumen they're trying to test your analytical skills how well you do math your reasoning um and is that game it has a cut off so ultimately what determines whether you're going to be shortlisted or not it's it's the game cut off it's not the deciding factor but you need to maintain a minimum score and then obviously you have the cover letter and cv and if you pass both of these aspects then you make it to round 1 um tips regarding the recruitment game i don't there aren't like There aren't a lot of ways you can crack the game, but my advice would be to utilize YouTube to watch examples of maybe people solving this game. You'll you'll find a lot of resources on YouTube, so I would recommend you to leverage that. Um, moving on to the recommendations, I think सबसे पहले जो मैं बात करूँ इट्स don't be part of the bandwagon. Um, consulting is something that's very popular within um lums, but if if you're if if you don't find problem solving interesting if you don't find it interesting to explore different industries i would say don't go for it pehli baat to ye and the reason the reason why i'm saying this is because um consulting work hours they're intense right yeah. uh, mere case mein you're putting 15 hours about 60 65 hours every week right agar aap itne hours put in kar rahe ho and you're not having fun it's going to make the experience really bad um during so when i was applying for the bain asia internship i had a lot of very good friends who were very capable but they weren't interested in consulting at all they were more interested towards that creative side um graphic designing so they never applied to bain so i think mera pehla pehli baat ye ke only apply to these firms if you're passionate if you find it interesting don't do it only because you see other people in your batch applying um ek ye cheez hai but if you do decide on applying to bain or applying to consulting firms i would say give it your all and yahan pe bhi bas ek important cheez ye hai ke don't determine your sex don't determine your success through the outcome of the recruitment process determine the determine your success through your growth and compare yourself with the past version of you kyunki when you're doing casing initial 10 12 cases may you struggle a lot but over time you realize that you're growing immensely and that skill set it helps you in other interviews it helps you in courses it helps you to think more critically so just enjoy that process and take the most out of it regardless of the outcome um the third aspect the third recommendation i would give for applicants is learn from the experiences of seniors who who made it to the aci program who made it who who, who joined bain ultimately 
um people who didn't join who weren't able to join bane um learn from their mistakes case with them and try to learn as much as you can from them because they've go- they've gone through this immense blueprint process so i think these are three recommendations that i have for future applicants thank you so much for sharing those insights sami um your whole bane ac i experience um and the work that you've done uh for and i'm sure that juniors who are applying for recruitment season right now or even from our own batches who are going to be applying to consulting can reach out to sami um and i think this is where i'd like to conclude the episode thank you so much for coming in sami and thank you all for staying staying until the end of this episode thank you goodbye and allah hafiz you've been tuning into radio lamps